Hey guys, I'm Neil Clint Smith, uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, so I'm going to be telling you about Hermes, which is a real-time hypervisor for IoT systems. This is work with my advisor, uh, Suman Banerjee. Uh, so I got kind of interested in uh, IoT systems and, and, uh, and hypervisor uh, for, for embedded devices because uh, it seemed like a good way to solve some uh, performance problems that I was having in uh, other projects. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but um, let me just start by um, going through, uh, just kind of telling the story of uh, what IoT systems are, or excuse me, what real-time systems are. So when I think about real-time systems, I usually think about anything that has um, hard time deadlines, uh, where if you miss a hard, if you miss a time deadline, then you know, be considered a failure, right? So you know, self-driving cars might be good. That if you miss a time deadline on your smartphone, you know nobody's going to jail. But you know there's other systems like uh, you know, self-driving cars that you know where if you if the thing hangs, that it could be a real serious problem. And so um, so that, that's kind of what a real that's what a real-time system is. And so the, you know the, the work uh, was really started by these two guys, uh, Lou and Leyland, in the early '70s. And um, I just typed. I just typed that paper's name into Google Scholar and, and uh, printed out the first few um, entries that came up. And, and you'll notice that a lot of this work was done like in the in the eighties into the early nineties. And uh, you know this, this is when a lot of the scheduling algorithms were developed for real-time devices. And the, the thing about this is that they had a kind of a different set of assumptions at that time than we do right now because the the landscape of uh, you know IoT wasn't even really a thing at that time, right? So the embed systems were totally different. Um, and so, you know, so, so their assumptions, uh, which drove their work in, uh, in the scheduling algorithms, were you know were a lot different. Right. So fast forward to today, this is what you know, a typical real-time system would probably look like. And if you think about it, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different stuff going on here. Right. So we might have a heart rate monitor on our smartwatch. We might have an accelerometer and other sensors going on. And we also have all this user interface stuff that we have to deal with at the same time. The weird thing about this is that if we're, if we're trying to work with all these different, um, you know, you could call them tasks or apps that are trying to coexist on this device, um, it, they have such heterogeneous requirements that it's very difficult to get these things to coexist inside one CPU with one real-time operating system that's kind of trying to manage time for everybody here, okay? And so, you know, so I would consider the stuff on the right to be real time. So we definitely want to make sure that those things hit their deadlines. Stuff on the left, you know, if it hangs, it hangs. You know, we also want to make sure that it has good performance too. Um, you know, but, but like I said, in general, it's difficult to manage the time requirements of these things. So if you bust one of these guys apart, what you're going to find is you're going to have a lot of different chips uh, inside one of these devices, right? So in the middle. We have, you know, what's labeled here is a 32-bit processor, and then scattered throughout the circuit board on this thing, we have a bunch of different chips that are all performing independent tasks on, 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 the, on board this thing, right? And um, the, the way, uh, you know, a lot of people choose to manage the real-time requirements on you know, a device like this is just to kind of split the tasks up into independent execution environments on different CPUs, right? So. Uh, you might have an accelerometer, which is you know which is running the accelerometer task independently of the uh, heart rate monitor, which is independent of everything else. And so you know so basically we can ensure that these things aren't going to interfere with each other because they're all split up among different CPUs. And the trouble with that is that you know it takes a lot of extra space. Obviously you can see that, uh, but it, it also probably uses a lot more power, and probably increases the cost of the device. So this is not an optimal solution. Okay. Um, just as a side note, you know, we heard in the keynote this morning, Mike was talking about um, splitting up uh, different processes among different uh, CPUs on, on the Android device, right? And I think he was really more focused on doing that for performance reasons and for power reasons, but it, it also can be done, you know, in this context uh, to meet real-time deadlines, right? So this is, this is something that people do. It's a real problem. So to that, I should also say that this is a problem that I had in some of my other research too, and that's how I kind of got um, going down this path, right? So, but I thought that I thought that I, I was crazy or something like that, and that I had introduced some kind of bug in my software that was responsible for um, missing, you know, missing real-time deadlines and creating performance problems. So what I did was I set up this uh, controlled experiment to try and test. 
to see if I could um, create, you know, create an environment where, where, where it could cause um, real-time tasks to fail, okay? So what I did was I have the, we have this um, CPU board here with the ARM Cortex-M7 uh, microcontroller on it, which is a fairly high-performance uh, microcontroller. It's a, I think it runs at like 300 megahertz. It's got a super scalar pipeline. It's, it's like top of the line uh, for microcontrollers right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to run two different tasks on this thing inside of a real-time operating system environment. Okay. So the first task is going to be the one that we kind of care about here. This is a real-time task, uh, and we're going, to, we're going to use a serial port receive as our real-time task. So we're going to measure the latency of the serial port received from the time that a character arrives on the serial port to the time that, it's, uh, that it's get, it starts to get processed by the user when in code. Okay. And the second task we're going to run here is this distractor task, which is uh, just going to be an Ethernet ping flood. And we don't really, in this context, we don't care so much about you know, what's going on here, but we're going to use that to create a bunch of I.O. load here and try and distract uh, from this real-time task. And you know, the goal of a real-time operating system is, is to make sure that, uh, that the real-time processes always take the same amount of time to complete no matter what. Right? So we want to, when we measure this thing, we want to see that we're always getting the same response time over and over again. So what we did is we, you know, in isolation, when we run this real-time task by itself, um, you know, we find that most of the response times are kind of clustered here around roughly about 4,200 clock cycles, okay? So that, you might consider that to be pretty good. You know, about 85% of the time you're, you, you're, uh, you know, you're getting a response uh, that's, that's pretty much, you know, average, okay? But when we introduce this distractor task running in parallel with our real-time task, that clustering kind of goes away. So then we start getting you know, tail here of, uh, of, of you know, additional latency, uh, which, is real, which is being caused by this uh, Ethernet ping flood, right? And in general, I would consider that to be really bad because this could cause us to miss a deadline, um, which could potentially result in failure, right? So, um, so, so I think that this, this is you know, definitely under high I/O load. Um, you know, here we can see that that um, it can cause real-time operating systems to uh, to miss their deadlines. And the, the trouble with this is that if, you know, if, if we have one of these things deployed in the wild, uh, what's going to happen is you're, you're probably not going to run this Ethernet ping flood in the lab, and then you're going to get it out there uh, in Timbuktu, and then you're going to start getting a high, high uh, Ethernet traffic, and the thing's going to fail, and then you're not going to have any idea what happened, right? So I think we've all experienced like intermittent failures that are really hard to trace down, and, and you know, that's probably going to be the result of something like this. Okay, so why is this happening? So the reason this is happening is because um, you know, we have a high priority ISR for our real time task, followed by this high priority uh, user mode uh, task, right? And if we run this over and over again, we have a short delay between the time that the character arrives at our um, serial port and the time when, it, when, when it's able to get processed by the user mode code, right? So, so this is like this is what happens when we're running a real time task in isolation. Now, when we add that that ping flood in. What's going to happen is we're going to run the um, we're going to run the kernel mode code to process the ping flood before the high priority uh, real time uh, user mode code, right? So what's going to happen is we're going to get a much longer delay, but this will only happen some some of the time. It only happens when we get um, a, you know a uh, a serial port received and an Ethernet packet that you know they're kind of co-located in time. And it doesn't make, it really doesn't make sense if you think about it. You know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't really be running uh, kernel mode code in, you know, low priority kernel, kernel mode code in front, in front of high priority user mode code. That doesn't, you know, that's not really a logical thing to do. But that's the way the CPUs are architected, right? Um, so, you know, so the solution we're proposing here is to uh, put this hypervisor in between the hardware and the real time operating system. And what the hypervisor is going to do is it's going to create a virtual execution environment for uh, the different um, tasks that we have running. Okay? And so what we can do is we can isolate these things just kind of like in the same way that uh, Fitbit was isolating the tasks among multiple physical CPUs. Uh, we're instead going to isolate the, uh, these different tasks among multiple virtual uh, CPUs. And the goal here is to be able to you know, still hit our real-time deadlines but do so in a way that we don't have to split the work up among multiple, um, among multiple processors, right? So 
hopefully we can save some power and some, um, you know, some, some area and stuff like that. So I won't go into too much detail about how this thing actually works, uh, but I will say that basically what this thing is, is it's just an, uh, an interrupt service routine that dispatches ex exceptions you know, from the hardware to the different uh, to the different guests that are running inside of it here. Okay, and so so the guests are running uh, in uh, user mode. They think they're running in kernel mode, but they're actually running in user mode. And every time they execute a uh, privilege instruction, it'll chat to the Hermes handler. Hermes handler will emulate it, and they won't actually know the difference. So they won't actually know what's going on. Just it's pretty similar to VMware or any other um, commercial. Uh, so if we run the same uh, task with our uh, distractor task and our uh, real-time task inside of the hypervisor instead of inside of the real-time operating system, we get similar results when the real-time task is running in isolation. Right? We get, you know, our, our response times are pretty, pretty well clustered around 4,200 cycles. But um, the improvement comes when we when we when we run the two uh, the, the distractor task and the real-time task in parallel with each other. Right. So the distractor task now is not able to um, to cause uh, any kind of a, a tail here uh, in the uh, latency because um, because we've created this isolated environment for our real-time task to run in and we're not allowing the distractor task to uh, we're not allowing it to run ahead of the uh, user mode code for the real-time task. Okay, so if we put these plots together on the left side, the two plots are sort of like isolated real-time task with in an operating system environment. Uh, operating system environment with the uh, distractor task, and then these two are the Hermes environment with and without the uh, distractor task. And you can see that inside Hermes, uh, we're getting much better clustering around the uh, um, you know this desired uh, response time. So, so basically, the, what this means here is that you know, every time we get one of these real-time events, it's always going to take the same amount of time to process. So we're never going to overrun our deadlines, right? So while we're talking about uh, I.O., uh, we can just do a quick uh, explanation of the I.O. virtualization strategies within Hermes. So there's really three ways of doing this, right? Uh, the first way is pass-through I.O., right? So every time we have a, uh, an event on a peripheral in our microcontroller, what we, what we can do is basically nothing. Right? We just hand that event off directly to the guest and let the guest handle it. So the driver code for that I.O. device will be contained completely within the guest. And Hermes basically has you know, nothing to do there. Um, there's a partial emulation I.O. mode where the driver for the um, peripheral device lives inside the hypervisor, and the hypervisor presents the simplified guest interface to the guest. Okay, so for example, if, it's in, you know, if, we're, if we're trying to send an Ethernet packet, um, there's maybe one function that the guest can call to the hypervisor which would uh, which would send an Ethernet packet. And then the, the driver to actually send that packet will live inside the hypervisor, and it'll do the real dirty work of getting that packet out to the Ethernet interface. Okay. And this is, the, this is the mode that most hypervisors like Zen and KVM and stuff like that, they use this. And then there's going to be a full emulation in which um, the hypervisor presents a full interface to the guest. And so the, you know, the, the actual driver lives inside the hypervisor, but the guest uses the full interface to, to talk to it. So we implemented the, the two on the left here, okay, pass-through and partial emulation. We did not implement full emulation because it's way too much work and uh, the performance is not as good as you'll see. So when we, when we benchmark this thing, uh, before I show you the results of, of, of uh, what the performance looks like on this thing, I'll, I'll tell you that I expected to see that pass-through emulation was going to give us the best performance, pretty much just because the hypervisor doesn't really have anything to do here, right? It just passes the, the plant up to the guest, and the guest deals with it. But what we actually found was that, um, so here's a bar chart of the uh, performance, uh, the round trip time for a ping packet. Um, you know, for first of all, with uh, just you know, with the Ethernet, um, with the Ethernet process running on the bare metal on the guest, okay. And in the middle, we have this partial emulation with the simplified interface. And, uh, and then on the, on the far right here, we have pass-through emulation, which is, which is the do-nothing approach, right? And so what you can see here is that the round trip time is a lot higher for pass-through emulation. The reason for that is that uh, basically every time the guest executes a privileged instruction inside of its driver, that instruction has to be emulated by the hypervisor. 
So if we execute a bunch of different privileged instructions in order to send an Ethernet packet out, all that stuff has to be emulated within the hypervisor. Whereas within the, with this partial emulation, the driver is fully contained within the hypervisor, and every time we execute a privileged instruction, that, that instruction runs on the bare metal. There's no emulation needed. Okay. So, kind of surprisingly to me, the um, the uh, partial emulation, um, the I/O virtualization mode, is actually the, the uh, sort of performs the best among all of them. So, in conclusion, I'll just say that we, you know, we presented this uh, hypervisor, which uh, which runs on microcontrollers that have no uh, memory management unit. Okay. Uh, it's designed to run on this ARM Cortex M7 core, which is a fairly high-performing uh, microcontroller. And what it does is it, it creates these virtual execution environments that isolate different tasks from each other so that the high-priority tasks always get preference in, in running before the low-priority tasks. Even, you know, even the kernel mode uh, software can't, from the low-priority tasks cannot supersede um, the software for the, for the higher-priority tasks, right? Uh, and then we, you know, we showed that it, uh, we can get better performance and lower latency um, by using Hermes to schedule these, these things. Right. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, so you know, there's a lot of benchmarks that we need to perform here, particularly with multiple real-time tasks. We only showed uh, the performance results if we have two tasks going on uh, simultaneously. We don't know what will happen if we have you know, three or four tasks trying to, trying to compete with each other on, on the same microcontroller. Probably will get worse performance, I would imagine. Um, we need to, you know, experiment with other kinds of I/O interfaces, and also we need to significantly dehack the implementation. Uh, so, look for uh, future papers uh, for that. Um, the code's all available on this website here. You don't have to write this down; it's in the paper. So, if you're interested, you can uh, go to that website. There's a couple of demo videos that show uh, how the how the thing works. Um, I think we have, I, I can't remember exactly what's up there right now, but there's a couple of demo videos. You can download all the code for it um, and uh, get a, maybe a better explanation of what's going on. But it's got a, a little bit more technical detail in it. So, anyway, thank you. I'm done.